Hello, Richard. Hello, Steve. Nice How to meet you? you. Fine, thank you. How are you? Doing very well, thank you. Good to speak to you. Well, it is, and I've been following you on YouTube. It's an amazing world we live in where we can communicate sort of indirectly and follow people and get to know people that we've never met, you know, in different parts of the globe. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the online polyglot community now is growing uh, week by week, it seems. And uh, it's really great to get to talk to you as well after, I think it's been maybe three, four years that I've been been doing this. And and you live in Macedonia? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I live in Macedonia. I'm in the UK right now. Oh, yes, but that's normally right. normally I'm uh, in Macedonia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I, I, you did a, uh, a, a podcast with David Mansare, which I listened to, which is very good. And I'm going to post a link here on my Thank YouTube you. channel. And if people want to know in depth about your background, your philosophy of language yeah. learning, they should go there. It's a very good interview. Both of you guys did a great job, I thought. Thank you very much. It was very enjoyable. He's such a good person to talk to as well. Well, he's a great interviewer. I was. I thought his. He's got excellent skills at interviewing, and you explain things I think very very well so that was that was great let's see if we can focus on a few things today subjects that regularly come up at my blog and elsewhere and the first one is this issue of talent like okay. I mean you even more so than me like you speak more languages than I do and of course the issue is like what about the average person okay you can right. speak those languages you know you were born with this uh, genetic predisposition or something so so what's your take on talent versus developing these skills it's a funny thing I don't see it so much as talent but um, a natural desire so it's like some people are naturally drawn to watching sports and they can recite all of the sporting events in a particular field that they like the scores when they happened who scored the goals who who won when they won how many cups whatever they know all the transfer fees and they remember this massive information but it's because they genuinely feel interested in it and they really love it. Now, I might decide one day I want to get into football and start looking at football games. I might not naturally be that drawn to it, so I'm not going to be able to retain the information as well. For me, I see it as I'm an extreme language learner, and I don't think that everyone needs to be an extreme language learner. It's not necessary. What's really good is if everybody takes an interest to learn enough of another language. I think it adds an extra string to anyone's bow and I think it gives you another dimension to you, not only your personality but the way you think about other subjects as well. Now um, Luca in his interview with David says something along the lines that he's a better language learner in whatever how old he is, 30 some odd, than he was uh, 10, 15 years earlier and I've said the same thing. I I feel at age 66 that I'm a better language learner than I was at age 16 uh f- for several reasons one because i'm more confident because mm-hmm. i've done it more times and i think my brain has become more flexible when it yeah. comes to accepting uh, and noticing different structures different sounds and so forth and so on so i tend to feel that this so-called talent is something that that improves uh the more you the more you learn languages uh, and, and i often use the argument that there are countries like sweden where people mm-hmm. all seem to be very good at languages, and I don't think that the Swedes have some gene that's no. sort of unique to the Swedes that makes them better language learners than the Spanish, for example. Definitely not. And um, when I think of a country like Luxembourg, for example, uh, where they have multiple languages, I mean, many people in Luxembourg will speak Luxembourgish, French, German, and then they've got the largest minority of Portuguese speakers outside Portugal. Um, in Europe and also they've got a lot of people from the Balkans so they'll have either Portuguese or Serbian Croatian at home as well in addition to the three uh, main languages of Luxembourg and then they'll normally speak fluent English as well Mm -hmm. so it's it you know it's a nation of people who have like four or five languages just from the word go and you don't think that's because they have a special gene no (laughs) So, but this seems to be the biggest obstacle, and I've often felt that if you can get people to learn one language, Mm -hmm. then they can eventually, if they're interested, and I get back to your point about the interest, I mean, some people want to learn one language, learn it well, they need it, they have a a spouse or something, go for it. And uh, some other people become then motivated to learn a second, a third, and a fourth. Uh, But once you get over, I found that once you had that experience of actually 
transforming yourself into a person who could feel totally confident and fluent in another language. That that's the biggest obstacle. And thereafter, yeah. the, 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 you know, the subsequent languages are easier to learn. Yeah, I, I, I agree to it. I mean, it, each new language group seems to be at a bit of a, a different step. Yes. So um, because of real dramatic changes in the grammar or the way you express yourself. And actually, strangely enough, I experienced that with Macedonian mm -hmm. to a degree because even though it's a Slavic language, there are a lot of um, things in it from taken from Turkish mm -hmm. and the way they express themselves is quite different to say how I'd express myself in Czech mm -hmm. uh, when I when I speak right. uh, which, which is quite unusual mm -hmm. um, yeah. but there's a, there, there are definitely those cultural things that you you learn as well and and that can cha you know change things up a bit I've been quite surprised when you mentioned Czech at how much difference there is between Russian and Czech and yeah. so these Slavic languages, it's not like the Romance languages where this basically, with the Romance languages, I have the feeling that it's one language, mm -hmm. variations of one language. Uh, but but the Slav uh, so, so far, in my experience with, with Russian and Czech is that they're quite different. The structure is very similar between Russian and Czech, yeah. but the vocabulary is tremendously different. Yeah, when you have, for example, with, there are certain aspects of the grammar that remain the same. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with with the perfective, imperfective verbs, that's a theme throughout the right. the whole group. Oh, okay. But All even, right. but even even the cases, for example, in Bulgarian and Macedonian, we don't have cases. Wonderful, um, wonderful. In, in Czech and Russian, that's a kind of a help. Yes. Um, and the same with Polish. Mm -hmm. But then, if you go, if you go to Polish, you'd find it um, interesting again because they have um, in the past tense where you've got the l form, which you have in R Russian and you have in Czech. Right. In Polish, they will they will add endings to that for each individual person. They'll add which a an ending. So, um, oh, I see. So, for example, a bill, 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 and then they, they'll add these endings to for the for the U form and for the oh. for the I form. Okay, well, let me move on then to another subject that was raised by one of the or several people who follow my blog, because we're talking about vocabulary in different languages. How do you hmm. learn vocabulary? And how do you keep up with this? Because we both agree that acquiring vocabulary is is the biggest part. Like time-wise, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the biggest part uh, of learning a language. I mean, you just need words. I mean, if, if I don't understand something, it's not because I don't understand the grammar, mostly. It's because I don't have the word. Yeah. And if I can't say something, it's because I don't have the word. So the question is, you've got however many languages, 16, I don't remember the number, mm -hmm. at varying degrees of proficiency. How do you learn the words? How do you retain them? Yeah, you're right. The, the words, learning vocabulary is probably one of the most challenging things because you've got so many things that you have to learn mm -hmm. to be really proficient. You're right. And how I go about it, well, as you said in the beginning, you know, about the, the Romance languages. So when I first started, my first language after English was French. But there are an awful lot of shared you know, vocabulary between the two, mm -hmm. which is a big help. And I learned it as a kid, so I learned very unusual vocabulary in French as a child. Mm -hmm. I learned all the animals, all the birds, all the plants, all the flowers, the things that you learn as a kid, you know. Right. And um, as well as you know all the little songs that you learn, you, you learn the lullabies and things in French. So um, I picked up a lot of vocabulary that way, and also through English and knowing the big words that you know that I I studied at high school and university. Um. Mm -hmm. But then actually re retaining new vocabulary, I find that I have to go through and, you know, like the link method, mm -hmm. you know, you re it's, it's, it, it very much sell this point as well, that you really need to keep repeating and repeating and repeating, seeing vocabulary in different contexts, right. making sure that, you, um, that you're aware of them and how they're used in different ways. And mm -hmm. it does take time for certain words to come in. And then when I see words over and over again, I think, I, I, just it. I try and think of a little mnemonic or mm -hmm. a little thing that will help me to, to catch the word. Right. Um, and, and that often sort of is the final nail in the coffin right. for it to stay in my long-term memory. Yeah. And do you find that um, with more and more languages, it's more and more difficult to retain the vocabulary or do they tend to stay in their little compartments in your brain? I'd be lying if I said that some vocabulary didn't float away as you move from one country to another. Um, there is some sort of, you know, an issue with with 
keeping the vocabulary current and 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 doing things like that um, there are words that you know i will i would have used and maybe it would be difficult to recall if i hadn't used the language in a long time especially very specific words and mm-hmm. mm-hmm. um, but then there are other words that are very similar so if you speak language regularly if you've got a language that's similar mm-hmm. you'll find that the vocabulary in that language is retained just by practicing the other language um, a good example of this would be portuguese and mm-hmm. We, Spanish. Yeah, we broke up there. Portuguese and Spanish. I agree. Um, yeah, what I find too is that. Uh, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, there you are again. Fine, yeah. Occasionally the pictures freeze a little bit, but that's okay. Okay. Uh, people will have to accept the uh, technology as it is, you know. Uh, what I find too is that, um, you know, the expectation that you can turn on the language, you know, mm-hmm. within 30 seconds, switch mm-hmm. from A to B to C to D without. And, and say not having used the language for six yeah. months or a year or two, that it'll all be there. That's an unrealistic expectation. However, I do find that I recover very, very quickly. And mm-hmm. it doesn't take much. Uh, and, and what I tend to do is just read and listen in order to yeah. bring my level up to speed. And I find that I'll recover most of the vocabulary that I need. And I also don't mind stumbling. I don't yeah, mind exactly. admitting I can't remember the word for even the most basic thing. It's yeah. often it's not the most complicated words that you forget. You'll forget the most basic right. words, and then you're reminded of them, and then they're right back in place again. And and I think anyone who speaks in many languages, I think most of us are quite prepared to stumble when we switch back into language number three or number four. Yeah, I think you know you're you're right. It, it there can be a stumbling block. I've I've been very very fortunate being that in my work in the past and also even now in my life, I have to go from one language to another very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, one job that I was on, um, I used to get the phone would come up and it'd have which country the caller was ringing from. Okay. And I'd have to answer the phone and say, Buongiorno, sono right. And then I'd, I'd have to carry on in Italian. Okay. Or it'd ring and it would be in, in Swedish, say, oh, good <laughs> right. and, and it would go on and on like that all day oh, okay. yeah. between about eight, eight languages and um, okay. that was fantastic for me <laughs> well that also trains the brain what we might do Richard is uh, you know we've got so many questions that have come up uh, yep. we can talk in English probably for an hour I, I'm trying to keep track of the amount of time here uh, what okay. we'll do is perhaps we'll end our English uh, portion and we'll move to French okay. and I think today again it's, it's hard to predict how these things are going to go but I think today we'll just do English and French and okay. uh, we'll talk about some of the additional questions that have been raised, uh, and mm-hmm. we'll try not to cover the same ground. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, so thank you very okay. much. And you needn't hang up, but, uh, well, actually, it's better. We'll hang up, and then I'll phone okay. you again, because then my recording system will, will record this yeah, great. separate interview. So thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Talk to you okay, speak okay. to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye.